Welcome to Calvary Church with Skip Hitek. Did you know that about 90% of the book of Revelation either quotes or references the Old Testament? From the beginning, the Lord communicated a great deal about the future to His people. In this teaching series, Pastor Skip explains the theology of the end times and the differing conclusions biblical scholars have reached. The end may be nearer than you think. Finding that God is doing exactly what He said. tornado outbreak continuing in the south. Right right now. Now. Shelter in place. We know the World Health Organization just to, to declare this a global health the city emergency. city of over in Iraq. I think it's going to be rebuilt. There's already things happening there today. I'm going to try them. Now for the last look. You ever see one of these? So uh, you can meet me uh, this afternoon on Central and uh, 4th Street. I'll be down. Are you coming? Okay, so uh, uh, we've all seen people that do this, or uh, I think um, you probably have. I know that I have a number of occasions. I distinctly remember the early days of Huntington Beach Pier where there was this guy who always did this kind of stuff and was yelling at people. Nobody paid attention to him. So I don't know how fruitful that was. But um, usually when in a film they want to portray uh, some fundamentalist, nutcase, Christian, they will have a guy with sandwich boards saying the end is near. And that, that becomes a mockable point in the movie. What's interesting about that is this past week on Thursday, February 2nd, uh, we let a rodent predict the future, <laughs> right? Puxatani Phil. So uh, you know how Groundhog's Day works, right? Uh, every year, for the last 137 years since 1886, uh, this guy's been predicting uh, the future. So. Uh, this is how it works. If he sees his shadow, what happens? Six more weeks of winter. If he doesn't see his shadow, we're going to have an early spring. So uh, from 1886 until now, he has seen his shadow 105 times. He has not seen his shadow 20 times. And the rest we just don't have historical records for. According to Storm Facts Almanac, uh, Punxsutawney Phil has been accurate. Okay, so get this. You, you have a 50-50 chance. You're just going to predict yes or no. You're saying maybe it's 50-50 accuracy. His accuracy rate is 39%. That's pretty bad. That's abysmal. So that's what happens when you let a rat predict your future. Um, it's one thing to predict the end of winter. It's quite another thing to predict the end of the world. People have been predicting the end of the world since the world began. Uh, people have looked to the Mayan calendar, Nostradamus, Halley's Comet, the Doomsday Clock, a number of other sources to say the end of the world is near. Every generation has heard this stuff. Every generation has seen the sandwich boards. But throughout history, that has come from some, I would call, credible sources. Credible Christian sources. Some of the great Christians of the past have been predicting the end of the world for the last couple of thousand years. I'll just throw a few up on the screen for you to just see their depiction. Ignatius, 110 A.D. So this is 20 years, 20 years after John wrote the book of Revelation. Ignatius said, the last days are upon us. Hippolytus, 236 A.D., Hippolytus of Rome, wrote that Christ was sure to return by A.D. 500. Martin Luther in the 1500s says, and I quote, we have reached 
the time of the white horse of the apocalypse, the world will not last any longer than another 100 years. Christopher Columbus. You say, Christopher Columbus? That guy, that guy was a sailor. Did you know that Christopher Columbus was a, also a Bible student, and in particular a student of Bible prophecy? He wrote a book called The Book of Prophecies. Christopher Columbus said the world would come to an end in 1656. And he said this, and I quote, there is no doubt that the world must end in 155 years. So we know that predicting the end is near has been a favorite pastime of a lot of people for a long time. A few weeks ago, for our New Year's message, I told you the statistic that more than half of all Americans believe that we are living now in the last days. That's significant because it's not just Christians or evangelical Christians. This is Americans. Over half of all Americans believe we are in the last days of history. Now, in this series that we are calling The End is Near? Question mark. In this series, I am not going to predict when Jesus is coming back because I, I value my life. I don't want to be stoned to death for being a false prophet. No man knows the day or the hour. So I'm not going to do that, but we are going to talk a lot about prophecy. In fact, that is the focus of this next series is biblical eschatology. Eschatology sounds like a weird word. Eschatology sounds like a, a medical specialty or something. Oh, he's a clinical eschatologist. No, eschatology means the study of last things. It comes from a Greek word, eschatos. Eschatos, last things or last times. The word eschatos is from a word we are about to read in 2 Peter chapter 3. It means the furthest or the final or the end. In this series, we are going to dig a little bit deeper than we have in some of our past series. I, I want to make you a somewhat of uh, an expert on the subject. I want you to kind of know your way around that theological world. So I'm going to go a little bit deeper. I hope you don't mind that. Um, I'm going to try to put the cookies on the bottom shelf. I always do. But uh, I want to show you uh, the different views of the millennium when we get around to it. We'll talk about what a a millennialist is, and a post millennialist is, and a pre millennialist is, and why you should even care about that. Why we view the prophetic scriptures, including the book of Revelation, in a literal way. Why do we do that? Uh, we're going to look at different perspectives of an event we call the rapture. Some people don't like that word. So they say the rapture isn't even in the Bible, so why do we talk about it? And what are the different views? And why is one view to be preferred over another? We're going to look at how God tells time in a whole different study. How does God tell time? He tells time geocentrically, using the nation of Israel in specific measure, the 70 weeks of Daniel. We're going to look at things like Gog and Magog, that battle that is coming up at some point in the future, and when does that stage, and, and among other things, including the coming of Christ. Now, there's a whole lot of Christians that think we should not be studying prophecy. Why study prophecy? They think it's not worthwhile. Why? Well, for a number of reasons. It's too uncertain. There's too many different interpretations of it. So they say, you know, it's better to focus on, on more solid aspects of the Bible where conclusions are more sure. I always laugh at that because show me one area of theology where Christians agree totally. I can't think of any. There's always controversy on every subject. We think through, we plod through, we discuss it, we dissect it. But they say, yeah, but then there's too many people that sensationalize prophecy. And there's a bunch of alarmists out there. And I, I get that, I understand that, I agree with that. There are a bunch of alarmists out there. I mean, you go to these prophetic websites, 
and it's all black and red with flames and capital letters with like 47 exclamation points after every sentence. So people get weary of that. And because of that, the blowback that comes from that notion of over-sensationalizing these things is, is let, let the future be what the future will be. Just let's find out. Don't even study it. Don't talk about it. Just whatever will be, will be. I call that Doris Day theology. Right? She's the one that's saying, que sera, sera, whatever will be, will be. The future's not ours to see. Que sera, sera, what will be, will be. Well, I want to give you four words that will dispel that notion. Four words that will dispel that notion. Four words that will undergird our study of prophecy in the coming weeks. The words are prediction, concentration, deception, and motivation. And I want to show you these words uh, from the principles found in 2 Peter chapter 3. So I hope you brought a Bible with you today. If you brought a Bible, um, turn to 2 Peter chapter 3. If you didn't bring a Bible, uh, borrow the person who has one next to you, look over their shoulder, or grab the Bible in front of you in the chair. That is in the back of the chair, not on the person's lap in the chair in front of you. <laughs> 2 Peter chapter 3. We begin with the first word, prediction. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 1. Beloved, I now write to you this second epistle, in both of which I stir up your pure minds by way of reminder. It's interesting, this is toward the end of Peter's life when he wrote this. So these are Peter's last days. And in Peter's last days, he is focused on the last days. Verse 2, that you be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets and of the commandment of us, the apostles of the Lord and Savior. Knowing this first, that scoffers will come, here's the phrase, in the last days. In the last days, walking according to their own lusts and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. He talks about the prophets. He talks about the coming of Christ. And implicit in his statement is that the coming of Christ and the last days was something that was predicted in the Bible. A conservative estimate is that one-fourth of the Bible is prophecy, one-fourth. To be more specific, 27%. So for anybody to say, yeah, here's the Bible, and you know what, I'm just not going to teach 27% of it, because why, 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 why get into controversy? I'm, uh, if you went to medical school and the medical school said, hey, let's train these doctors in training, uh, everything except 27%, uh, I don't want to go to that doctor. In fact, prophecy is God's calling card. It is what God uses to authenticate himself, to prove himself to people. Isaiah 46, verse 9 and 10 it says, for I am God, I alone, I am God, and there is no one else like me. Only I can tell you what is going to happen even before it happens. Everything I plan will come to pass, for I do whatever I wish. God says, compare me to any other deity, any other God, any other system. Nobody can do what I can do. I can predict the future. I know everything, the end from the beginning. By the way, no other holy book has prophecy. Not the Quran, not the Vedas, not the Bhagavad Gita. None of them have prophetic literature. The Bible's full of it. So there's prediction. And specifically, the last days are predicted. It was a question the disciples had of Jesus in Matthew 24. Tell us, when will these things be? What is the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? Now, this phrase that 
Peter mentions here in verse 3, last days, or verse 3, last days, um, appears five times in the New Testament. Once in the book of Acts, so that was written by Luke. Once in the book of 2 Timothy, so that's written by Paul. Once in the book of James, that's written by James. Uh, once in the book of Hebrews, that's written by, we don't know, uh, could be Paul, could be a number of other people. And uh, once in the book of Peter, here. So we have at least four, if not five, separate New Testament authors that use this term, the last days, the last days. In the Old Testament, they speak of the same period under several names. Isaiah, Jeremiah, Hosea, and Micah use the term the latter days. Daniel calls it the end. He also calls it the appointed time. He also calls it the time of the end, and he also refers to it as the end of days. So the question, the end is near? Is the end near? Are we in the last days? Yes, we are. Yes, we are. But we've been in the last days for the last 2,000 years. You're going, oh, did you have to add that part? I really like the first part. We're in the last days. We're in the last days. To say we've been in it for 2,000 years sort of diminishes a, a little bit. Well, I'm going to do a whole study on how God tells time using Israel, Daniel 70 weeks. But technically, the last days began with the earthly ministry of Jesus Christ and will end with the second coming of Jesus Christ. Now, how do I know that for sure? Because in the book of Hebrews, chapter 1, Hebrews was written how long ago? How long ago was Hebrews written? 100 years ago? 200 years ago? Anybody know how long ago was it written? About how long? 2,000 years ago. 2,000 years ago, it says this. God, who at various times and various ways spoke in times past to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by his son. Writer of Hebrews says the days he was living in were the last days. Then on the day of Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit came upon the disciples in the upper room and freaked out everybody in Jerusalem, they thought these disciples were drunk. Peter stands up and says, these are not drunk as you suppose, since it's only nine o'clock in the morning, third hour of the day. But this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel, it shall come to pass in the last days I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh and your sons and daughters will prophesy. So, yes, we are living in the last days, but so was Ignatius, so was Hippolytus, so was Martin Luther, so was Christopher Columbus. Maybe this will help. Next week, Next weekend, I hear there's a football game. You heard about that? Okay, so let's say in the football game, it's the fourth quarter. And let's just say, I'm not going to say this is going to happen. Let's say your wife is cruel and she wants to get you out the door like now. It's, it's right in the middle of the Super Bowl, fourth quarter. And you go, we got to go, we got to go. And you tell her, okay, um, it's going to be over soon. How soon? We're in the last quarter. Hey, ladies, I'm going to help you out a little bit. That doesn't mean it's going to be over soon. The last quarter is 15 minutes, but there's timeouts, there's penalties, there's all sorts of things that make an NFL game uh, three and a half hours, three hours, sometimes more long. So last, we're in the last days, last doesn't mean short, last means final. It means there's nothing more after that. So if you look back in history, there was creation, there was fall, the fall of man, there was a covenant, there was law, and now we're in the age of grace. We're in the final quarter. God doesn't have another play after this. He's not sending another message after this or more messengers after this. This is it. We're in the final quarter. But we saw something in our study 
on New Year's about the end times, Jesus said there would be signs, signs that pointed out. And we, we told you that the word for, for, uh, for that is birth pains, that the signs are like birth pains of a woman. That's the word that is used. And uh, birth pains, we told you, uh, they happen, well, I don't have to tell you women when they happen and how, but when they are more frequent and they're more intense, you know that the time is coming for the birth. And so we are seeing certain things, and as the time marches forward into the future, as we get closer, the contractions are going to occur more rapidly. So though we can't know the day or the hour, I think we can know the season. We can know the season. Like, okay, we're we're getting pretty close to the edge here. Paul said to the Thessalonians, of the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I write to you. You'll be able to tell what, what the time is, what the season is. So prediction, that's the first word. Second word is the word concentration. The Prophecies of the scripture concentrate, focus, um, centralize on something. Go, go back to chapter 1 of 2 Peter. 2 Peter chapter 1. I started you out in chapter 3. Go to chapter 1. Look at the 16th verse of 2 Peter chapter 1. And see if you can figure out what, uh, what event he's talking about here. For we did not follow cunningly devised fables when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For he received from God the Father honor and glory when such a voice came to him from the excellent glory, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And we heard this voice which came from heaven. And we were with him on the holy mountain. And so, we have the prophetic word confirmed, which you do well to heed as a light that shines in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your heart. Remember what incident that was? It's called the what? You can say it out loud, it's church. Transfiguration, the transfiguration. Um, At the transfiguration, Peter was there. Who else is there? James and John. Peter, James, and John were there with Jesus. Who else showed up? Moses and Elijah showed up. And uh, there was a transfiguring. They were transformed before the apostles. And you remember what Peter said? Peter said, hey, this is awesome. Let's build three huts here. Three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. I'm so glad that God the Father interrupted Peter. Um, This is my beloved son. That's what Peter's referring to. This is my beloved son. Listen to him. Like, zip it, Peter. We don't want to hear from you. We want to hear from him. Listen to him. Now, what Peter is saying here is that Jesus is coming because it's predicted by the Old Testament Scripture and we had that confirmed by our own personal experience, the transfiguration. We read about it in prophecy. We experienced it sort of on that mountain. The transfiguration is what is known in the film industry as a trailer, a preview of coming attractions, a highlight, a clip, if you will. Peter, James, and John got a clip of an event that is more fully described in Revelation chapter 19. That is the glorious coming of Jesus Christ to the earth. That's the point. The point is the focus of biblical prophecy, the focus of last day events, it's not the rapture, not the tribulation, not the European Union, not Gog and Magog, not the mark of the beast. The focus of eschatology is the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the star on the center stage of prophecy. Every prophetic subject that deals with the last days focuses, centers, concentrates on Jesus Christ. 
So, for example, there's much about Israel in prophecy. Why? Because Israel is the genetic national conduit that gave us Christ. There's much about the rapture. Why? Because the rapture is what unites us believers physically with Christ. There's much about the tribulation in prophecy. Why? Because it is that season that will prepare the world through judgment for the return of Christ. There's much, much, much about the millennial kingdom. Why? Because it describes the literal kingdom of Christ. It's all about Christ. All about Christ. When uh, Jesus was having a conversation with the religious leaders who opposed him, uh, he said to them, you search the scriptures, for in them you think that you have eternal life, but these are they which testify of me. You read that book, you study that book, you underline that book, you memorize those verses. Don't you realize that what they're really talking about is moi? They testify of me. The Bible, all 66 books, essentially, here it is in a nutshell. The Bible in a nutshell, it's about one person and two events. That's the whole Bible right there. One person, two events. One person is Christ. Two events, first coming, second coming. First coming, redemption. Second coming, rule. You're going to find, um, you're going to find that uh, the prophecies of the future center around either the predictions of his first coming or his second coming to rule. I have a love-hate relationship with Luke chapter 24. I love it because, well, I'll tell you why I love it in, 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 as I explain this to you, but I also don't like it because of what is left out. So in Luke chapter 24, uh, Jesus has risen from the dead. He meets two disciples on the road to Emmaus. They don't know it's him. He walks up alongside them. You know the story well. And uh, they're so bummed out that Jesus has died. They think it's hopeless. It's, it's, it's over now. And, and Jesus says to them, this is so cool. Oh, foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have written. Ought not the Christ to have suffered and entered into his glory? Then it says this, and beginning at Moses and all the prophets... He expounded to them in all the scripture the things concerning himself. I love that. What do I love about it? It's the first Bible study after the resurrection, and it was a prophetic Bible study. Number two, well, let, me, let me not go to number two. Let me go to why I don't like it. What I don't like about it is that Luke left it out. This is so cool. Jesus showed up and gave a prophetic Bible study. What do he say exactly? Well, beginning of Moses and all the prophets. Yeah, well, could you like fill in a little more of that? I'm just so, I feel so cheated that that's not in the scripture. Love to have a CD of that. I'm guessing Jesus must have taken them to Genesis chapter 3 and explained the seed of the woman who will crush the head of the serpent. I'm sure he must have discussed the coverings of skin that the Lord provided as an atonement for their sin. I'm guessing he went to Genesis 22, where Isaac was almost sacrificed on the exact same mountain Jesus was sacrificed on years later. He probably went to Exodus chapter 12, talked about the blood of the lamb on the lintels and the doorposts. Probably talked about the Levitical sacrifices and how he fulfilled them and the tabernacle structure and how he fulfilled that. He probably stopped at Leviticus 16, talked about the scapegoat. I'm that scapegoat. No doubt he talked about Psalm 22. No doubt he mentioned Isaiah chapter 53. He may have even looked at Daniel chapter 7, the son of man prophecy, and Daniel chapter 9. How many of you have one of these? Anybody have a device? Okay. So, uh, do, you have a, do you have a passcode? Do you, is yours locked? Do you lock yours? Okay, not everybody does. Um, I don't, which is dangerous. But um, um, 
How many of you have an app on your phone or apps on your phone? Okay, do you have passwords for those? Do you find, like me, that keeping your passwords, that, that's sort of hard. It's like, what is that password? Where did I put that exactly? And it's hard to keep track of all these passwords. But every device, every app, every system has its passcode, right? You have to put in letters, numbers, or symbols that make your password to unlock it. I'm going to give you the code to unlock prophetic scripture. It's a five-digit code. You're going to want to write this down. This is important. because it'll un- You put this code in every Old Testament verse, and it just opens up for you. Here it is. Here it is. Here it is. J-E-S-U-S. You guessed that. You knew that was coming. That's the password. That unlocks the scripture. It's amazing how when you put him in Isaiah 53, it blossoms. You put him in Psalm 22, it makes sense on and on and on. So just as the planets of our solar system revolve around the sun, all nations, all events, all of God's plans throughout history rotate around his sun. And the study of last things will lead any mature believer who responsibly studies eschatology, it will lead you right to Christ every time. It will enlarge Christ every time. It will magnify him and show him more capable. So prediction, concentration, third word is deception. Deception. You got to bring this up because... Uh, It is predicted probably as much as anything else concerning the end times. Jesus in Matthew 24 uh, repeated it uh, frequently that in the last days would be false messiahs and false Christ and false teaching and much deception. And he said many people will be deceived. Now we know there's always been that. That's always been part of truth and God's work is that there are deceivers. But... You can expect an uptick in that activity as we are in the last days. I think we see that. I I would describe today as sort of a cultural syncretism. Uh, Much like what happened in the Old Testament when they started bringing idols into God's temple in Jerusalem. Uh, That's syncretism. They, They were basically saying there are many different gods and many different options. And yes, there's our God, Yahweh, but he's on a par with all the other gods and goddesses of the land. And so our culture speaks of much tolerance. That's that's its favorite word, tolerance. Uh, We are told to celebrate everybody's morality or immorality, to tolerate everybody's religious ideas or non-religious ideas. Their favorite bumper sticker is coexist. You've seen that on the back of cars, coexist. The only evil that they see in the midst of all of that is one, and that's us. Fundamentalist, Bible-believing, Christ-anticipating Christians, those are the real enemy. They don't tolerate us. Now, deception is going to have two opposite sources. It's going to come from two places. Number one, inside the church. Number two, outside the church. Inside the church is... 2 Peter chapter 2. Look at chapter 2. Chapter 2, verse 1. But there were also false prophets among the people, pointing to the Old Testament. There were false prophets, even as there will be false teachers among you who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the Lord who bought them and bring on themselves swift destruction. And many will follow their destructive ways because of whom the way of truth will be blasphemed. The entire second chapter of 2 Peter is devoted to that, apostates. An apostate is a defector, somebody who leaves the truth, who says, yeah, I'm not into that stuff anymore. I was before, but I, I, that's, I, I've grown up. They will defect from the truth. They will be in the church. This will be the religious world in the last days. 
a falling away from historic Christianity. Here's the supplemental verse, 1 Timothy chapter 4. Paul writes this, The Spirit expressly says, now that's very important. He just doesn't say the Holy Spirit is saying. He says, the Spirit expressly says. The Holy Spirit specifically says. The Holy Spirit is saying something that you underline and put a star next to and highlight in yellow, expressly. The Spirit expressly says that in the latter times, some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines taught by demons. Did you know that every single New Testament book, except one, that's the book of Philemon, predicts false teaching and gives warnings against false teaching? And if you don't believe apostasy is real, read Revelation 2 and 3 sometime. Seven letters to seven churches. Every letter except one, Jesus says, you guys are blowing it, you're blowing it, you're sliding away, you're leaving the faith. So don't be surprised When a Christian leader suddenly announces, I don't believe this stuff anymore. (gasps) Don't be shocked when a Christian influencer on social media, like some musician that you followed, now renounces belief in Christ. Or when a theologian decides to deconstruct the truth, that's their favorite word, to rethink long-held Christian beliefs. Ever heard the name Ted Turner? Yeah, have you ever heard of CNN? Yeah, he, he invented CNN. So Ted Turner, for, for years, has criticized Christianity. That's nothing new. But what you may not know is he was raised in a Christian home, a very strict Christian upbringing. In fact, Ted Turner said at one time in his life he considered being a missionary. He said, and I quote, I was saved seven or eight times. Now, that's just Ted Turner talking. You can only be saved once. He said, I was saved seven or eight times, but he became disenchanted with Christianity after his sister died because he prayed and prayed, and God didn't answer his prayer, so he got disenchanted. And then he said this, the more I strayed from the faith, the better I felt. The more I strayed from the faith, the better I felt. But it's going to have another source. It's going to come from outside the church. Go back to 2 Peter chapter 3 where we started. Verse 2, be mindful of the words which were spoken of by the holy prophets and of the commandment of us, the apostles of the Lord and Savior. Verse 3, knowing this first, that scoffers will come in the last days walking according to their own lusts and saying, where is the promise of his coming since the fathers fell asleep? All things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. We've heard this stuff for years. We've watched people with sandwich boards for years. Everybody's predicted the end of the world for years. Nothing has changed. Everything stays the same. Scoffer. That's the voice of the secular world. The mocker. A scoffer is a word that means... One who treats lightly what should be taken seriously. One who treats lightly what should be taken seriously. I'm going to put verse 3 up in a different translation, the message. I just want you to see it because it's so picturesque. First off, you need to know that in the last days, mockers are going to have a heyday. Reducing everything to the level of their puny feelings they'll mock. I got my attention. Look at it again. Reducing everything to the level of their puny feelings, they'll mock. It's as if the Bible anticipated social media. (laughs) Now, all of this deception is going to culminate. It's going to culminate in Revelation 13, where a culture, society is so stripped of any godly influence, that the leader that emerges will be known as the beast. The beast, having seven heads and ten horns, consolidating governmental power. That's where history is moving, where government opposes and tries to control worship. 
the last days. Prediction, concentration, deception. Let me give you a final word as we close. Motivation. Motivation. Now, these four words are going to undergird our whole study uh, in the rest of this series. Motivation is the last word to look at today. Chapter 3, verse 10. He's still on this subject. Here he is. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. That's where the world's headed. Therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God because of which the heavens will be dissolved, being on fire, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. See what he's doing here? He's using the end of the world to motivate them, to stimulate them to godly living. Now, follow Peter's clear logic. If the Bible predicts the last days, and it does, and if it describes it as a time of spiritual apostasy and secular contempt, it should evoke a certain response among God's people. And what is that response? Well, certainly not a materialistic response. If everything in the material world is going to be incinerated, if you're like a hyper over materialistic person, you're going to be in sad shape. It should evoke a godly response. It should make us holy and hopeful because, as he says, we're looking for a better world, new heaven, new earth. Check verse 11 out. He says, therefore, since all these things are going to be dissolved, the house you just got into, isn't it fun? It's awesome. It's going to burn up. (laughs) That car is so shiny. It's going to burn up. Man, I just got a good deal on these clothes that wherever, going to burn up. And so all these things will be dissolved. I like this. What manner of persons ought you to be? Here's a better translation. Here's a literal translation. What exotic person should you be? What out of this world or foreign manner of person should you be in other words he's saying the world is not our home and because it's not our home our conduct should be otherworldly a bit more otherworldly than it has been tim lahay and ed heinson two men that i've served with preached with loved uh, now in heaven said nothing motivates the christian like the study of prophecy It puts an evangelistic fire in the heart of the church. It gives believers a vision for world missions. It injects a desire to live a holy life in an age of unholiness. That's the profit of it. When you believe Jesus Christ is coming again and you really believe it could happen at any moment for you, you're going to lead a clean life, right? When my mom used to say, your dad will be home soon, changed everything about my attitude. And so 1 John chapter 3, when he is revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is, and everyone who has this hope purifies himself just as he is pure. One of the best ways to purify your life is study prophetic scripture. So what have we learned today? We've learned that if you're going to take the Bible seriously... You better study prophecy. You have no right to leave one-fourth of it out. And when you do study prophecy, the proper study of it is going to lead you closer to Christ. It's going to drive you to Him. You're going to see Him much clearer. But when you do, there are competing voices inside the church and outside the church to deceive you, discredit you, and derail you. Yet, keep at it, 
because the study of prophecy will motivate you like nothing else to a godly life. So now let let me sum up this whole message with one little statement. Ready? Keep your hand, keep your eye on the sky and your hand to the plow. That's how you live. Keep your eye on the sky, keep your hand to the plow. Remember that. Let's say it together. Keep your eye on the sky and your hand to the plow. Say that to your neighbor. Keep your eye on the sky and your hand to the plow. In other words, anticipate the future. Look for the coming of the Lord. Anticipate that, but let that motivate you in the present to be responsible and godly. So listen, we're in the fourth quarter. We're in the fourth quarter. God has no more plays after this. He's not sending another Messiah or another holy book. This is it. We're in the last days. Fourth quarter. Game on. Father, thank you. Oh, you go ahead. Uh, you, were, you were wanting to applaud for the... Lord, we, uh, it is such a, it's so worthy to celebrate this. It's so awesome um, that you spent so much time uh, telling us about this incredible event the coming of Christ. He came once to deal with sin. He's coming again to rule and reign with those who have been forgiven of their sin. He came to redeem once. He'll come again to rule. We look forward to that. We're told to look forward to that. We're told to be ready for that. Help us to do so in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us for this message from Calvary Church with Skip Heitzig. We would love to know how this message impacted you. Share your story with us. Email mystory at calvarynm.church. And if you'd like to support this Bible teaching ministry with a financial gift, visit calvarynm.church slash give.